to fall in the hands of uh, other civilization that wouldn't necessarily understand how to deal with it. You would have, I'm sure, an exit plan, a B plan. And I believe that their B plan was they had a community of high priests fairly far away from the temple that where high priests were constantly being trained in the order to be able to handle the Ark of the Covenant. So that if anything happened at the temple, the Ark would be swiftly uh, taken out through underground tunnels, and many of them have been found now, that would bring them out of the city and, and bring it to their uh, temple, to their place, so that they could handle it there and keep it safe. And that might be why no writing about that community was found by scholars for a very long time. Nobody knew they were there, either than this Bedouin that threw a rock in a cave, heard a pot break, and, and, and thought there may be something in there, and eventually found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, all of a sudden, um, it starts to make sense, and I... I I was um, getting a better picture of my, what might have happened. Now, interestingly, there's new evidence that's coming out. And, well, there's a few things. One of them is that most of the writings of Qumran, most of the Dead Sea Scrolls, are not allowed to be re released to the public. Only, I believe, a uh, hundred scrolls have been released to the public, and the rest is not um, uh, has not been released to the public at all. Um, I find that interesting. I wonder why. But certainly, the fact is, is that there is evidence that Joseph and Mary, the parents of the one that was actually called Emmanuel in the Bible, uh, the name of Jesus came later on, but in the Bible it's very specifically said, to be Emmanuel, um, were Essene and were from the Essene community. So imagine this child coming into the field of this extremely powerful object and growing into the field of it. Imagine having an object that is like a transducer for the power of space-time, all the information of the universe in that point. When you're close to it, there's a lot of information transdu trans transduction that's going through your DNA. That could make you be able to do things that the average human beings cannot do. It's like a little torque on your space-time reality. <laughs> all right? And um, certainly walking on water is evidence of gravitational effects. At a recent press conference, famous videographer James Cameron and filmmaker Simcha Jakovavicki presented a controversial documentary called The Last Tomb of Jesus. The research reports on an ancient family tomb found under a construction site and documented by archaeologists in 1980. The controversy comes from the cluster of names that was discovered engraved on some of the ossuaries. One of the most prominent inscriptions reads, Joshua, son of Joseph, or Jesus, son of Joseph. Another bears the inscription, Maria, or the modern Maria. And yet another read, Mariani Mara in Greek, which may correspond to Mary Magdalena, as Mariane is the name found in the Acts of Philip to describe her. Though the names found on some of the ossuaries are common, it is significant to find all of these names with biblical references clustered in the same family tomb. More significant for our purposes is that it seems that many ossuaries of the first century Judea Christians bared a very specific geometric configuration. For example, the ossuary marked Mariani Mara bears very defined geometric decorations that in the context of our research have extreme significance. Indeed, once again we find the very structure of the cube octahedron or vector equilibrium engraved on an ancient artifact. 
It is even carved in such a way that the lobes or petal structures of the matrix are apparent in 3D. The same typical geometry is found on other ossuaries, one of which is marked Judah, son of Joshua. Certainly the claim that Mary Magdalena and Joshua may have had a child is controversial, but the symbols that are found on these ossuaries and others from the first century AD have striking significance. It is as well significant to note that both the one called Joshua or Emmanuel and Mary Magdalena were in some traditions considered to be a representation of the living ark. These symbols, as well as we have seen earlier, are found in many different traditions and specifically in the Egyptian Osirian temple. This temple is associated with the resurrection of Osiris, with the help of his consort Isis, and may denote the structure of space-time and some of the most powerful and profound knowledge of the time. Significantly above the entrance of the tomb was a unique facade, a carefully crafted chevron and circle that mystified the archaeologists. In the words of Dr. Shimon Gibson, one of the archaeologists present at the opening of the tomb, there's no doubt about it that those symbols meant something. It's unlikely that the family or the person that came and carved out the tomb just carved these things at random. They had to symbolize something. What they symbolized, I don't know. But it's quite rare to find that kind of ornamentation on a simple tomb. Interestingly, thousands of years prior, at the beginning of the Pyramid Age, a mysterious conical stone deemed to have cosmic origins is found in ancient Egyptian traditions. The Binbin -bin stone was housed in the Temple of the Phoenix and was associated with regeneration, rebirth, and celestial cycles and was thought to be the divine seed. The Binbin -bin stone disappeared long before Herodotus, an earlier Greek historian, visited Egypt, but not before it had relegated its name to the apex stone placed on top of pyramids or obelisks. One such example was found from the Pyramid of Amenemhet III and is housed at the Cairo Museum. It bears the inscription, King Amenemhet III sees the beauty of the sun. He sees the Lord of the Horizon sailing in his boat over the sky. Would this be the Lord of the Event Horizon flying in his ship in the sky? Interestingly, this most sacred object is almost a perfect match to the so-called chevron found at the entrance of what may be one of the most significant archaeological discoveries of our time. The chevron and circle is typical of the symbology of the ancient Egyptian all-seeing eye. Again, we see that this most important symbol in the Egyptian tradition was used to describe a fractional series from half to the magic fractional structure 1 64th. The symbol is as well found as representation of ultimate power on the top altar of Mayan temples and is depicted on walls in various ancient locations of the Americas. I continued to study some more and I realized that tetragrammaton in Kabbalistic tradition is typically um, denoted or described as this triangle structure with the, in this case, the letters of God in it. And if you actually look at the way the letters of God are laid out in it, um, it's like an isotropic vector metric. Okay? So one, two, three, and four. There's four layers to the isotropic vector metric. If you took the first layer here, you'd have one, two, three, four on the bottom, three in the middle, two here, and then one on top. Just like the way these letters are laid. And I, uh, and the Kabbalistic tradition are very clear that you shouldn't take the letters at face value, that actually each letter has a mathematical number attached to it, and that it's the numbers that have a meaning as well. So if you look at the numbers of the tetragrammaton, then it's 10, 5, 10, 6, 5, 10, and 5, 6, 5, 10. And they all add up to 72. And sure enough, in the Bible and various texts, you find that the number of God 
is 72. Or the number of faces of God or the great name of God is 72. So it all works. It's really nice. The thing is, the thing is, is that this is only 